Hi, my name is Lon Bender, and I am remixing Oliver Stone's 1991 film, The Doors, in a near-field Atmos format. Atmos near-field is similar to theatrical, however, there are only four speakers overhead versus a whole array of speakers. So the plane that's in the ceiling is something that has to be approached through moving sounds through the space of the four speakers that we have in the near-field environment. Well, in thinking about how I approach the mix for the doors, the Atmos format delivers us a whole different spatial plane than we have in theatrical. In a theatrical environment, you have a spatial plane that's about the ear height of the audience, and then Atmos delivers a ceiling plane that can be manipulated anywhere from the mid-plane to the ceiling. So this new area of the in watching or viewing environment gives the audience a chance to become more engaged and more engulfed in the experience of the film. The original mix, which was directed by Oliver Stone and Wiley Stateman and Mike Meekler did all the mixing on that film, had a lot of specific subjective qualities to it because of the nature of the film. The ability of the Atmos format to expand on some of those ideas was really what excited me about doing this project. So the film had particularly a great deal of music in it, a lot of uh, concert scenes, and as well as a lot of scenes where we have dialogue and music behind it. So I was very interested in using the overhead spatial plane to deliver some in more complete experience for the audience. So that way our audience could experience the same thing that the audience is experiencing in the film in a more deep way than they did originally. Not to say they didn't originally, because the film was full surround mix in 1991, but this format gives us an opportunity to manipulate, putting different sounds between lyrics, between music, sound design, into the ceiling in a very specific way. So I'm a huge fan of The Doors. I am a person that listened to them all through my teen years. And so when I had an opportunity to actually work with the material, it was very exciting to me. So I was uh, able, with the arrangement that we had to do this, to create two sets of masters. We had the original masters that played in the field that is at ear level. And then on a second set of fader masters, I replicated those and was able to drive them into the ceiling environment in a specific way as needed. So if I wanted to move the lyrics into the overhead without moving the band, I could do so because the center channel was mostly separate from the sides and surrounds. Or if I wanted to pull the whole thing back and move it over the audience and then manipulate how deep that was, I could control those things separately. So the aesthetic choice of when to do that was something that just hits you as you're working and you respond to what the action is and what the story is. And if you feel like you want to expand a certain idea, it gives you a whole tool set to do so in terms of the manipulation of this additional ceiling field versus the audience level field, which is often referred to as the Atmos bed, which is the level of a normal theater that's hitting you at your own eye level. I think that people are working on Atmos music releases because people that have home theaters want to listen to you know, music as equally interesting manner as people that want to watch films utilizing this additional ceiling plane. And that's really what is exciting about Atmos. But it's not to say the sound is always in just the ceiling. There's a space in between the bed and the ceiling. So oftentimes things are played between the two. So there's a mixture of both overhead speakers as well as the frontal or surround speakers. So it's a, a situation where it's not all or nothing. There's a very big area of aesthetic choice to be made between the two to, again, bring the audience into a space or pull them back out and push them back onto the screen. Uh, well, going from mono or stereo to Atmos, you have to first get the mono or stereo tracks off the front and bring them into surround speakers and then also move them into the ceiling field. So that is a two-step process, whereas in a 5-1 format where you've worked on a film 
in 5.1 or 7.1 and you want to bring it into this environment for Atmos, um, oftentimes people create Atmos tracks and they will put tracks down into the Atmos tracks and then use the panners to move the things up into the ceiling plane. I came up with a scheme several years ago for a native Atmos mix that was sort of one of those aha moments when I went to Dolby with the other mixer and said, what is this about? And they said, well, there's the bed and there's the ceiling. And I thought about it and for the next three nights I couldn't sleep. It's a true story because I realized that there's this plane up here and there's this plane here. And instead of using the objects as panners, I decided I could use them as waypoints in space and create ceiling planes of different shapes, whether they were just flat or whether they were shaped like this or whether they were shaped like this. And then as I blew stuff into those fields, well, not my, but the mixer, Doug Hempel in that case, uh, on a film called Monk Comes Down from the Mountain, when we blew sounds into these fields using dynamic busing with the sends instead of the main outputs, you could put any sound into these different shapes and it would blow them around from all the original Pro Tools pans into these ceiling fields. And it was very successful. So to apply that to working with masters, I basically took the same concept and I made a copy of the original 5.1 masters that were always playing in the upper field of the ceiling. And then between going through two different faders, I was able to manipulate things up into the ceiling field and back out of it seamlessly without just punching up or punching down. And it wasn't necessary to have uh, at most specific tracks because every track was an object, which we also did. We, we used the objects for everything except for the subs in this case because we didn't want to have trouble with any kind of phasing or anything in a down mix. And when everything is an object, that you can move it anywhere. So we used the bed speaker arrangement. We used Atmos objects to create that. We did not use the actual bed that comes part of the Atmos project process. And so the subs are the only thing which are not handled by objects are in our 5.1 stems and our 7.1 our, uh, stems. Everything else is playing as an object. Well, you know, the biggest challenge with working with an older film is getting the masters. That's the most difficult thing because they're off some, often somewhere in a vault or they're with a distributor or it, they're very hard to find. Fortunately, here at Formosa Santa Monica, we had done a near field 5.1 and 6.1 mix of this film several years ago. And so we actually had the masters here. So that was a huge plus. I think that the archiving system that is in place is effective but it takes time and it can be a big part of the challenge to actually getting the masters. Once you have the masters and you can put them into some sort of template that handles moving sounds from the normal theater level into the Atmos overhead system, you're in fine condition and then you can just go on and move forward. The Doors has so many things that is amazingly suited for Dolby Atmos because there are big concert scenes there's big crowds, the music, the band, the singing, all of those things are just asking to be all around the audience and to be able to really engage them in a way that is more possible by bringing the actual sound out and over them. The other component of a film like The Doors is there's a huge subjective quality to the film and there's a lot of subjective sound use and sound mixing that the original mix contained. And so in those cases, I was trying to expand on those ideas without changing them. A big part of this was not changing the inherent sound of the film. You know, I didn't want to all of a sudden start panning things all over the place and making it into like a circus, because it's, it's not a circus. It's a serious film for, about this guy's descent, and trying to stay with the theme of that was super important. And so in all cases, I would always consider what's the intent of the filmmakers, and stick with it and add a little touch of extra that we have the ability to do with Atmos, because that's what we're calling for. We are trying to expand on it, but we want to do so without losing sight of the original intentions. Oliver Stone relied on Wiley Stateman, who was his main collaborator and is his main collaborator through his entire career. And I've been partners with Wiley for 30 some odd years. We started Soundlux together and we've been working for many decades together. So when he wasn't able to do this, he turned the project over to me 
and gave me complete responsibility to deliver it in the way that uh, he wanted it, that he knew how Oliver would want it. So we talked a lot about it, we reviewed se certain sections, and between the two of us, as a collaboration that's been going on for so many decades, I think we've very successfully delivered what it is that Oliver's looking for. In preparing for this project, I spoke with Wiley at great length about Oliver's aesthetic, and I've worked on and been involved with most all of his films for many, many years. But in watching his films, I have always been impacted by his aesthetic of using subjective sound, the presence of sound, the lack of sound, the manipulation of it, in order to tell the story that the characters are experiencing. So as a viewer of his films, which I've enjoyed since the first ones like Talk Radio, all the way through Natural Born Killers and all the rest, he has impressed upon me as a viewer how important sound is to him and how getting everything in its proper place and pushing the audience to experience an image or experience uh, a scene or storytelling in conjunction with the use of sound is of vital importance to him. So I wanted to make sure that this component that I was adding to the film The Doors here in 2019 would add to that in the same aesthetic that I believe Oliver would be very pleased with. In approaching the live performance aspects of The Doors, I wanted to utilize the ceiling for vocals and for the band, but I wanted to also separate them a little bit and be able to try, particularly when we were out with the audience, to bring the vocal of Morrison out into a space more over their head more, so it felt like they were out there, but he was reaching them. That seemed very important, that he's reaching everyone in the whole environment. So in the New Haven concert sequence, which things are going crazy and it's uh, really f sort of getting out of control, I wanted to add some more components of discomfort for the audience as things were going sideways. And so I started to play with some delays in order to sort of get some rub in the music. And that helped bring things up into a place where you're sort of feeling a little bit more agitated. And I also worked uh, with the crowd material as well and tried in the sequences where he had the camera down in with the audience, I could also help envelop the audience for just the lines and things that were around them. So when you're in an audience and you heard someone in the distance, you could really feel that they were over here or over there. And I think it was a really effective use of the sound component of those sequences. <laughs> There are times when you want something to just have an organic quality to it. For instance, in this film, in regard to the Atmos approach, there's some scenes where um, Jim is inside the studio and the engineers are inside the control room and they push the button and they come on in the studio over the, the comm speaker. So in those cases, I would place the comm speaker voice instead of in the front where it would be in a normal environment. I placed it back over his head. So you really felt like this is a complete organic way it would be, but it was very effective because you could hear when they're on tape, it's all in a space, and then st everything stops and it pushes the button, and all of a sudden the voice is out here. You really feel like what it would feel like to be in a studio as an artist. So I thought that was a pretty effective use of a small, subtle component of Atmos versus all the big sequences. Sometimes it's just in the detail, it's the small things, it's not always the big things that make it valuable. Because the environment, as people say, is hugely important, even if it's just an environment that we're used to living in. Because we live in a world where we can tell things that are up or down. It's not just a matter of left to right or front or back. So that component of this film was also part of the process, and we took time to make that work as well. I gonna love you till the heaven stop the rain I'm gonna love you till the stars fall from the sky you and I 
just uh, had a bit of a technical problem. My aesthetic perspective on any film I do, whether it's a regular film, meaning a theatrical release, or whether it's an Atmos film, I believe there's a strong relationship between the image and the sound. And you want to have the perfect relationship at all times with the image and the sound. So if things are too loud and you're pushed back like this, or they're too quiet and you're leaning in, what do you say? Both of those are problems. So I've spent a lot of energy over many, many years trying to push this sort of perfect relationship where everything is absolutely in the pocket. And everyone does that. Everyone that are professionals, that's the job. The job is to make it so you don't notice it's happening. It just feels natural and you're in the environment. So when it comes to Atmos, I wouldn't necessarily want to call attention to some fancy pan flying through the ceiling or flying overhead or anything like that. I'd want to be derived from the images and derived from the character's experience who's experiencing that moment. Because we're always telling stories from the perspective of the character. And the sound, whether it's for a theatrical 5 or 7 one or for it's an Atmos mix, you want to stick with the characters. And when you're thinking about a project in advance, when anything's possible, before you have to actually do it to make it happen, I always try and stay with the characters and then how they're experiencing things. And most directors are looking for the same thing. They want the character and they want the story to be told by what's happening in their scene, what the character is experiencing, and that includes all the sound and all the images working together. So I would not be a proponent of flair for no reason. I am much more of an organic uh, person when it comes to looking into how this kind of work is done. And I think that my, the credits and the films I've done have actually shown that uh, to have a very organic quality to them. And they're all uh, sonically in sync with the images that are around them. And that's been one of the great experiences of being a sound person in this industry for almost four decades.